morning, everybody. Um, I hope you can all hear me from all parts of the room. It's a very wide room. Um, and uh, first of all, I'd just like to welcome everybody. I'm really delighted to see so many people here. Um, and I hope that, you know, delighted that you, you're interested and can be part of the conversation. Um, the other thing I want to do is just to, to thank a few people. Um, to, thanks to Michael, uh, Michael Foley and Sarah Bowman from um, Trinity PPI Ignite, which is our Centre for uh, Participant Engagement and Research in Trinity, which is really trying to promote um, engagement between researchers and the people that their research concerns. Um, I'd also like to thank our speakers today. So we have Amber Regrock, uh, Dr. Amber Regrock, who's come from the University of Cambridge, um, who will be speaking about um, international research and a European consortium in autism research. Uh, Dr. Ava Foreman, who's a clinical geneticist, a consultant clinical geneticist here in Ireland, um, who's very much involved in rare disorders research. Um, and to Jamie Riley, uh, who um, is an autistic adult, who is also um, a researcher uh, and a scientist, and will be talking about um, his experiences of both. And so we're delighted and very grateful to them uh, for coming and um, for agreeing to speak. Um, and actually, I really would like to thank a special person, is Dr. Lorna Lopez. Um, who works with me in Trinity, and she's a starting uh, investigator. And really, this uh, <coughs> conference is her brainchild because not only is Lorna uh, a talented uh, genetics researcher, but she's also a very, very talented and interested in um, public engagement. Uh, so she's put together the ideas for today, and it's been framed around us uh, talking about the past, the research that we've done over the last 20 years, uh, the present, the research that we're doing right now, and what the potential is for the future. Um, so I'm the old person <laughs> in the group, so I'm going to talk about the past. Um, and many of you might have had the opportunity to participate in our studies before. Um, and w I started doing research in Trinity in autism uh, in around 1999. So that'll tell you how old I am now. So. Um, why, why would we study autism, I suppose? Well, I guess um, autism is a really fascinating subject uh, and we can ask lots of interesting questions about it. And the brain, uh, aut people uh, with autism or autistic people have really fascinating brains um, that can tell us a lot about neurobiology and uh, tell us a lot about how we study, what we understand about brain function. Um, so going back, to 1999 when I started to study autism uh, we talked about it as been a really rare condition um, and we thought it didn't affect people with normal intelligence and um, now I kind of had little inklings that it did because I was a child psychiatrist as well working in the health service and I saw lots of kids who had normal intelligence uh, who had uh, autistic symptoms but probably didn't have you know a diagnosis uh, or, or they probably weren't called autistic. Uh, people often talked about it as being a terrible disorder and very few people knew about autism <coughs> and there, were ev there was even a lot of um, uh, blaming, particularly of families, uh, parents or vaccines um, and there were a lot of dangerous treatments. Around the time that I came into working <coughs> in autism research was time when there was research going on in chelation <coughs> and secretin and, um, and people were being exposed to things that weren't <coughs> evidence based um, but you know they could, they could cause harms. Uh, today we know that autism is a common condition, it affects people with all different kinds of intelligence and we acknowledge that not only you know is there autism as an entity but there's a spectrum of neurodiversity mm -hmm. and people are much more aware about the needs of people on the spectrum. Uh, we acknowledge that autism uh, differences are probably related to genes and to environment, um, but we still have dangerous treatments. I think we all can recall even maybe two years ago where there was all this controversy about the use of bleach as a, as a treatment um, for children with autism. So people, you know, are vulnerable, you know, when you've got um, a condition that for some people might be really impactful on their lives and you want to find ways to help them. But we're really challenged when we're studying the brain because 
the brain's in a very inaccessible part of the body. So I often feel very envious of people who study things like the heart or the liver because it's much more accessible and you can often look for differences in blood um, or samples that are easily accessible. But of course the brain is our most delicate organ and it's very firmly protected inside our skull so it's hard to access and to study except if we're using um, you know, uh, neuroimaging techniques and really a lot of these techniques have only sort of advanced and developed in the last <coughs> 20 years. So in 1999 I wanted to try to understand autism using genetics. Um, and at the time I was fortunate to be given a fellowship uh, and a couple of HRB grants uh, and we wanted to study genetic variants that increase risk for autism. This was the first study that we started and we wanted to recruit 150 people and their, uh, uh, with autism or autistic people and their parents to this study and we were going to find <coughs> risk factors, so things that might make you more at risk so for autism. Um, so where do genes fit in? So I thought I'd just, you know, I'm assuming that most people don't, are, are having the same level of interest in genetics as I, that I have. So I'm going to assume that people know very little about genetics. So we know that in our bodies we have cells that comprise the tissues in our bodies and inside the nucleus of the cell are the chromosomes and the chromosomes are made up of DNA and the genes are in the DNA. Uh, and the genes do amazing things. They tell our bodies to make various kinds of proteins um, so uh, that we can, um, you know, that, that basically are involved in our growth and our development and our body function and all kinds of skills and abilities that we have. And within, uh, so those, these chromosomes in our bodies, uh, so we have 20 three pairs of chromosomes and we tend to think of those as 22 normal pairs of chromosomes that are numbered from 1 to 22 <coughs> and then sex chromosomes that make us male or female. So females have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y chromosome. So when we're thinking about genetics, I like this analogy that compares genetics to a cookbook. It's kind of like our recipe for life. So the, the DNA um, contains all the recipes. Um, and a gene is kind of like a recipe for your favourite cake um, and the cake is the product if you like. So our genes um, are made up of a different um, code uh, and which is a little bit like the spelling in your recipe. So I like, and it's a little bit oversimplistic but I like to think of um, the idea that if you were making a cake and you wanted to put flour in your cake, uh, if, you're, if, you're cake, if your flour is spelled F-L-O-U-R, you're going to get a cake. If it's spelled F-L-O-W-E-R, you'll get something that um, doesn't really resemble a cake. So uh, similarly with our genes, if you get changes in the code, you can alter the product of the protein, either in a way that where it still works, but maybe doesn't work quite so well, or where it might stop working completely or even do something damaging in your body. Um, and the other concept that we just need to, to remember is that genes are about our family uh, because we get our genes from our parents, on average 50% from either parent and siblings more or less share about half of their DNA. Uh, and so we know that genetic risks are passed between generations and we know probably all about certain conditions where they're passed very strongly between generations. We call those autosomal dominant genes. Some of you might have heard of the condition Huntington's disease, for example, um, which has a 50% chance of being uh, uh, transferred between um, the, um, a parent and offspring. Um, or we also know of certain genes that require both parents to have the risk, uh, certain conditions that require both parents to carry the risk gene. Um, and these are often called autosomal recess of genes. And um, so we'd be very familiar in Ireland with cystic fibrosis. So cystic fibrosis, both parents have to carry the risk gene or the risk allele. Uh, and then there's a one in four chance that there, a child might be infect, uh, affected by this condition. However, most conditions, including autism, heart disease, diabetes, uh, have many, many different genes that might increase the risk. So there's no one gene for autism, uh, but there are possibly genetic changes that increase your risk. How do we know this? Well, 
Um, one of the classic studies that would have been done going back to the 1970s was to look at twins, because twins are like nature's own kind of experiment, if you like. We know that if you're a fraternal twin or a non-identical twin, you, you're kind of like your siblings. You just share maybe 50% of your genes, of your DNA. But if you're an identical twin, theoretically, you share about 100% of your DNA. And so when you want to study if something is inherited in a family, if you compare the rates in the identical twins who share more of their DNA with the rates in the non-identical twins who only share about 50% of their DNA, and you see a higher rate in the, non in the identical twins compared to the non-identical twins, you sort of infer that there, there are heritable factors. Um, and we know that in autism, that identical twins tend to be affected far more frequently than non-identical twins. Now, those studies can differ, but in general, the main message is that we t tend to see higher rates between the, mo the monozygotic or identical twins. The other way we can understand if something runs in a family, if it might be to do with uh, genetic risk factors, is when is looking at recurrence risks. So do we see things happen more frequently within one family compared to another <coughs> family? So, um, and this is quite variable in autism because recurrence risks from 6% to 19% have been reported. So that could be anywhere from one in five. So your chances if one child has autism of a subsequent child having autism might be anywhere from one in five to one in nearly 20. Um, but again, it still is an increased risk compared to the, the risk in the general population, which we know is about one in 100. Um, but it's not so easy because this is, if, if you were uh, looking, you might think to yourself, if, if your family, um, if there's an autistic person in your family, you're thinking about who else in my family has autism. Um, you might think, well, in, so I just drew out this as an example, kind of thinking about how families might be affected. So in this family, we've got a boy here who has autism. Uh, and his younger sister has autism and intellectual disability. And then if I was the psychiatrist or, the, or, or say, a pediatrician in a, in a clinic asking about family history, um, the family could report, well, actually, um, my, uh, the, the mum might say, well, my brother's child has autism as well. Uh, but going further back in the family, no, you know, often I get the story, well, my dad maybe was a little bit odd. <laughs> um, and then, oh, you know, then on, on the dad's side, he, he'd say, well, do I have a, a cousin over here and they have kids with autism as well? And in, one is autism and one is intellectual disability. So that kind of story might seem familiar to, to some of you. So it's not a very clear kind of pattern of inheritance. And what it tells us is that there is no autism gene. There are probably many genes that increase risk. And there are probably many environmental factors that increase risk of having autism. So one of the things that we were involved, it, w some of the work that we've done over the years, we're kind of looking at different kinds of genetic risk factors. And this has probably been the thing that's changed the most in the 20 years since we started to study autism genetics. We know that there are different kinds <coughs> of genetic risk factors. So when we're thinking about changes in the genetic code, we can have, um, you know, which are just is the sequence um, of the genome. We can have like a single change in, a, in the code, but that might be relatively common in the population. <laughs> and we might see that, you know, increased a tiny amount in people who have a condition, any condition. Um, uh, but we also see changes that could be very rare. So in this situation, the risk, say, for whatever condition it is, might be increasing by just maybe 1.5. So it's not a very, very increase, uh, highly increased risk. But for some of these rare variants, these sometimes make that big change in the protein product. So it's like trying to make your cake out of flowers instead of wheat flour you might get quite a big change in your protein product and it might have quite a big effect. And in this case, you might see that very few people who don't have the condition carry that risk variant, this rare variant, but you know, a few, 
a small number of people with the condition carry it, but the relatively the risks are much greater. So in this example here, maybe your risks go up maybe five times if you carry this rare variant. So again, in and of itself, it's not the only thing that's maybe increasing your risk for the condition, but it's certainly having a stronger effect. And um, the, the way I think about common variants as well is that many genes, for example, can make you tall or small. So if we were to measure everybody in this room, we would probably get uh, measurements for, for women and men. Obviously, men are slightly taller on average than women. Uh, but we'd see this, this sort of difference that kind of goes from very small to very tall, with most people kind of being somewhere in the middle. Um, and each of the genes that make us a little bit taller or a little bit smaller are only doing that by a tiny amount. There are probably hundreds of genes that, you know, make us e either taller or smaller. Um, so uh, one of the things that we set out to do about halfway through the 2000s was to look at those kind of common genetic changes that might make you at increased risk for autism. And this was a project called the Autism Genome Project and the Autism Simplex Collection. And it, this was a collaboration in Ireland between ourselves and Trinity and researchers at UCD, uh, Dr. Sean Ennis and Professor Andrew Green. Um, and there are also international collaborators, so there were 12 sites in Europe and in the US. And our objective was, if you want to try and find these small genes, is like I started out the very first study with the lofty ambition of collecting 150 people and their parents. But for this study, we were going to have to recruit thousands of people. So the objective was to recruit about 2,000 people to try and find some of these common genetic changes that might increase risk. Uh, but we also, around that time, became aware that there were other kinds of rare genetic changes that might increase risk as well. So we wanted to do both at the same time. So our objective was to put together, you know, sa you know um, large cohorts of people with autism and their parents across Europe and across the United States um, and to study these risk factors. So when we went to look for common genetic risk factors, this, I'm not going to explain this diagram other than to say is that we didn't do that well because, because uh, probably because we still didn't have enough people. We only had 2,000 people. Uh, and we found one kind of place on chromosome 22 that probably increases your risk for autism by about 1.1. So it's kind of a tiny, tiny risk. Um, so there's, it also told us that actually common genetic risk, while it does increase your risk for autism, there's something else going on. And that was probably <coughs> the really revolutionary change. Um, so I'm going to just go back to the example of Down syndrome because I think most of us know about Down syndrome and we understand what Down syndrome is. Um, it's associated with a very particular physical kind of appearance and also people with Down syndrome are reported to have very particular kind of personality traits. They're often reported to be um, very friendly and sociable, but also a little bit stubborn sometimes. And they also have increased risks for certain psychiatric problems like uh, anxiety disorders and obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, and the cause of Down syndrome has been identified as having an extra copy of one of the chromosomes. So instead of this, uh, you know, of somebody with Down syndrome having 23 pairs of chromosomes, they've got 23 pairs of chromosomes plus an extra chromosome, uh, uh, which is chromosome 21. And this is that we know there are a number of syndromes that are like this, where you might get extra chromosomes uh, that associated with developmental and particularly intellectual disability syndromes. And in autism, for example, it was very well known that you could get this extra duplication of part of chromosome 15. Now, that's associated with a syndrome, you know, um, where people might have a lot of intellectual disability, of which autism is just part. But we did know that there were a number of these chromosomal changes in autism. And this study that we did, um, and actually this was part of my PhD all those years ago, when we were um, investigating um, uh, the, the common, or in our genetic studies, we used to test 
every um, every subject for a chromosomal abnormality because it was known that people had them. And we discovered um, that somebody had this tiny, tiny piece of chromosome 2 missing uh, on one chromosome. Um, and it, it turned out that it was subsequently inserted into another chromosome. So this sort of thing can happen with your chromosomes all the time. And actually, sometimes it doesn't even bother us. Uh, you know, but in this case, we thought that it was probably contributing to autism in the, in the person. But the actual thing that is really interesting about this is that unless you're an eagle-eyed cytogeneticist, these things can be really hard to miss. And around this time, I think it became apparent that you weren't always able to detect these things using the techniques in the, that they had in the lab at the time and that newer technologies were starting to pick up these things that were uh, kind of deletions in the of chromosomes or duplications of chromosomes that were um, only picked up by, um, uh, by newer techniques. Um, and we came to call these, um, so this is in the broader field of genetics now, not in autism genetics, they came to call these uh, copy number variants. And they were really to do with small parts of chromosomes being deleted or duplicated, um, and they could disrupt genes that might lead you to have, uh, you know, problems as a consequence of that. Um, so in this particular study, the Autism Genome Project, this became a new rare variant that we identified that was associated with increased risk of autism, probably affecting maybe 5 to 10 percent of people. And um, the <coughs> upshot of that was that testing for these, um, uh, these changes in the genome became part of routine clinical care, I suppose maybe around 2008, 2009, uh, or 2010. And um, some people, some researchers would say that up to 20% of people might, uh, that a specific genetic cause might be found. Um, sometimes these are known genetic conditions such as Fragile X or Rett syndrome or visible chromosomal rearrangements like the ones I showed you before, but a proportion of them, maybe 5 or 6% of them could have been these submicroscopic arrangements. So. The interesting thing about these is, though, they don't just cause autism, and that's where the, the um, I suppose, the story gets a little bit more complicated. We certainly know, because there are maybe, I don't know, 12 or 15 recurrent ones of these that happen that increase your risk for intellectual disability, autism, and in some cases for schizophrenia, although they're much less likely to cause schizophrenia or psychosis as they are to cause autism or intellectual disability. And the other thing that we know about some of these uh, syndromes is that they're not necessarily inherited from a parent. They can just arise in the individual who's affected because it can happen in the germline when the sperm cells or the egg cells are dividing. So this was a new kind of understanding in some ways of, of um, how autism might arise um, through genetic mechanisms. Obviously, we know that there are many other um, factors. But one of the things that we ended up doing then more recently, one of our studies has been to follow up one of um, these um, chromosomal syndromes. So there's this one called Neurexin 1 deletions. Uh, so neurexin 1 deletions um, affect a gene called neurexin, which is a very important in brain structure and function. It helps to create uh, specialized <coughs> and stabilize connections between uh, neurons that are involved in learning in the brain. And uh, we, um, we identified in Ireland uh, a number of people who are carriers of Neurexin 1 deletions, and we got funding from Science Foundation Ireland to follow them up in a lot more detail, kind of clinically and neurocognitively, and using brain imaging, um, and also, and I think Jamie might talk a little bit about this, um, we, uh, for, we managed to get skin cells from some of the patients that um, Professor Sam Bing Shen in Galway could create little cell models for, so actually grow um, cells into, into 
brain cells and then look at how they're functioning um, in, the, in the laboratory. Um, and so we have already completed a whole round of studying these um, uh, people who have Nurexin 1 deletions and some of the people didn't have a whole lot wrong with them really at all. Maybe they had very subtle kind of neurodiversity sort of characteristics and some were very, very affected. Um, and uh, we noted that there were some, some changes in the brain, although these are not, I think they need to be studied a little bit more. It's very early days for that. Um, and then this is the process where in Professor Shen's lab, they create, they take the skin biopsies and they uh, make iPS cells and then turn the iPS cells into, uh, after this process, they turn the iPS cells into brain cells that can be tested in the dish and, and, and looked at to see how they're functioning. So it might help to tell us a little bit more. But it's not the whole story, obviously, because we know that both genetic and environmental risk factors lead to abnormal uh, or atypical development in autism and in other psychiatric conditions. And so our model for this is really that genetics might play a role in changing or shaping how certain brain proteins are functioning. And that might change how certain circuits work in the brain together with environmental factors. And that might produce you know, these different neurodevelopmental outcomes. So we still have an awful lot to understand, um, in particular about environmental factors. So we know that parental age can play a role. That's probably been the most robustly identified environmental factor. Um, and th that's probably linked more to these spontaneous changes in the genes in the eggs and, and sperm when they're dividing. Um, we know that pregnancy-related complications such as trauma, ischemia, and reduced oxygen carry little risks as well. Not very big risks, but they can also increase your risks marginally. And then smaller effects have been associated with things like obesity and diabetes and, and even cesarean section. But these are tiny, so they're not causative. They're only increasing your risk by a tiny, tiny amount. And our problem is that we need very detailed clinical data like registries to try to understand things like environmental risks. And we need to be able to follow people up from the long term and into the long term. And then we need really clever um, uh, bioinformaticians and mathematicians who can bring together these data so that we can understand how they act together to increase risk. Now, people asked, uh, and I know in the run-up to our conference that there were some comments about epigenetics and whether or not epigenetics was something we were going to deal with today. So <coughs> epigenetics was, uh, is, a, is a technique for looking at how environment leaves changes on your genome. So your basic sequence doesn't change, but sometimes genes can be switched on and switched off based on what you're exposed to in the environment. Um, and we can find marks on the genome that can give us a little bit of a clue about environmental factors. But I think that it's still very, very complicated. Um, there are lots of challenges with epigenetics research. Um, we typically take blood, you know, to study the genetics. So epigenetic changes might be very different in the brain from what they look like in the blood. So it's very difficult for us to make any, draw any conclusions and we need, and they are very expensive studies that need much, much longer, larger samples at the moment that are maybe not financially viable. So where do we go from here? So we know that both inherited and not inherited genetic factors might increase risk for autism. This has led to the introduction of new tests that are done <coughs> in children who are showing evidence of, um, of atypical development. Um, and we are also learning more about the biology of the brain, but we don't know how genes act together to increase risk, and we still don't have a full picture of the genome. So there are newer technologies such as genome sequencing, which are going to help us understand those a little better. Um, and we don't understand gene-environment interaction. And I suppose what, one of the things that we want to understand today is how interesting is this, or important is it, for autistic people and for their families? Um, and I think that's what we hope that we can hear from you all today. <laughs>